So, ladies and gentlemen, there are our focal points. Thank you very much for joining us today. It's my great pleasure to welcome you for the fourth session of the ArtSAF series, technical trainings delivered under the ArtSAF program. My name is Jane Hoopy. I am the director in charge of the IKU Environment Program. And I'm here with IKU officers working on ArtSAF and with focal points on the environment from the IKU regional offices. This series had been developed following yeah. IKU engagements with many states participating in the ArtSAF program, which highlighted the need to level up conceptual understanding of SAF. Once again, I'm pleased to see you in high numbers, which is a reflection of the sector's interest in SAF and how this series works in addressing knowledge gaps among states. Over the past few months, we have been able to cover introductory bases of uh, SAF, SAF sustainability and reporting under the Corsia, and SAF technology and certification. Today, we will have a session dedicated to policies for SAF and cleaner energies, and we'll provide participants with useful information on various policies mechanisms that can support its development and deployment. As you can see from the agenda, we will spend some time covering IKEA guidance material on SAF policies, and following which we are very pleased to count again with the expertise of our ArcSAF partners, who will be showcasing the various types of SAF policies in practice, either in development or implemented in their states. We have also requested them to spend some time detailing what were the motivations, needs, intents behind the SAF policies and the processes to develop them, including very useful, practical advice that can assist other states that are starting on this process. So today we are very pleased to count on the following at SAF part, uh, partners for this presentation. Uh, Ms. Marcelo Anselmi from ANAC Brazil, Mr. Nathan Brown, and Ms. Anna Odani from the US Federal Aviation Administration, Mr. Daniel N from uh, CAA Singapore, Ms. Mathilde Tanus from the GSE France, Eva Honey from uh, European Commission, and Satoru Togami from MLIT Japan, and last but not least, Ms. Alejandro Rios from Khalifa University. As you can see, you have a very, very experienced experts to talk to you about policies. They are engaged in that area and they have very, very kindly volunteered to share their knowledge, expertise and experience with states as part of the ArtSAF series. I hope you make full use of the session to ask questions or clarify on matters pertaining to policies on SAF and clean energies. We encourage every participant to make today's training as interactive and collaborative as possible. Uh, there will be time allocated for questions and answers after all our ArcSAF partners have taken the floor. You are mostly welcome to raise your hand with the dedicated Zoom button. Submitting questions in the chat is also much welcome as we will be having the questions and answer sessions only after our presentations. I also wish to insist that all questions are perfectly valid questions. Go straight to the point, please. Let me know. Um, let me now hand uh, over to uh, Bruno Silva, our IKEA Fuse officer, who will give you a short update on the ArtSAF platform, IKEA's guidance on SAF, and Bruno will be moderating the session thereafter. With that, I wish you all a very excellent session ahead. Thank you. And Bruno, floor is yours. Thank you, Jane. So good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. So as we have been doing, like I'll just give a quick update on ActSAF here and before we hand over to our speakers. So again, reminding like uh, uh, we are updating our ActSAF platform constantly. The last uh, ActSAF series on uh, technical certification is now uploaded to the, to the website, including a video and a presentation. We have received very good feedback on this session. So like, if you haven't uh, seen it, like I really invite you to take a look at it. And in the next slide, uh, uh, again, updating on our plan for 
the next series. So today we'll have the, ex, uh, the, the series on policies. So uh, we originally we were talk, would, would be talking about policies and market outlook on the series, but we identified that it, we, we had a lot to talk about policies, like there's a lot going on around the world on policies. So we, we decided to, to focus on policies on this series, and then we will continue with, with the, the uh, market outlook in May. We'll have a short break in April. We'll be uh, dedicated to the uh, environmental regional seminars in, during the May, uh, during the May, uh, month of April. So we'll come back to the series in May, and we also added one additional uh, series uh, eight to talk about self feasibility assessment in September. So and again, this is all subject to review. So feedback is welcome. Please provide any feedback you may have on these. Like if you there's anything missing here, please let us know. And next slide, please. So some updates on the feasibility studies. So I mentioned this last time. So we are uh, already developing three feasibility studies under an existing uh, EU project. Uh, there's an IKO and World Bank project being structured and that our study is being pursued by XF partners. And we also had financial resources provided by many uh, XF partners that will allow many additional feasibility studies. So, and uh, to facilitate this process, we are developing a template for self feasibility studies, which will allow comparability between results and harmonize its structure and facilitate the outreach of results. So, uh, I'd like to make an open invitation here to XF partners to contribute to this work. So, by identifying experts or consultants that could contribute to these two initiatives. So, to make it clear, right? So, we will, we are looking for contributions on the development of these feasibility studies. So if anyone has uh, experience on this kind of study and would like to work closely with us on that, please let us know. And also if you know any uh, consultants or any experts that could be suitable for developing these feasibility studies, so please let us know as well. So the requirement is just to have expertise uh, with development of clean energy studies. So not necessarily an XF focal point. So please contact us if you have any suggestions and if you wanna to contribute to these uh, efforts. So with that, we can go to the next slide. And uh, before we, we move to our speakers, I'll briefly mention like the ICAO policies on SEF and related materials. And so in the next slide, just a reminder, right? We have international policies uh, at ICAO that are applicable to SEF. The most uh, known one is probably Corsia, right? Because Corsia allows an aeroplane operator to reduce its offsetting uh, requirements through the use of Corsia eligible fuels, which include sustainable aviation fuels and lower carbon aviation fuels. And Corsia includes international approaches for sustainability and life cycle assessment of fuels. But besides Corsia, we also have the 2050 ICAO vision for sustainable aviation fuels. So there, there is a lot of policy uh, uh, aspects in, in the vision. I just highlight here that the vision calls for a significant proportion of SAF used by 2050 and a level playing field with other sectors. And we will be reviewing this vision uh, this year in CAF3. And actually like all these processes uh, will feed into the CAF3 discussions later uh, on the year. And of course, we have the long-term aspirational goal, uh, which shows that the largest aviation CO2 emission reductions will come from fuel related measures. And the LTAG agreement includes also various uh, policy related aspects, such as uh, related to policy planning, regulatory framework, implementation support, and financing. So, of course, well, I won't go into detail on that, but just to remind that we have a lot of policies at ICAO already at an international level. So, next slide, please. So, uh, beyond the policies, we also have uh, a lot of guidance materials available on policies in our website. So I'd like to highlight here the ICAO guidance on potential policies and coordinated approaches for the deployment of SAF. So it was developed by CAPE and it is a support reference to ICAO member states to develop SAF production. So it has insights on types of policy measures and their impacts, many examples of policies and links to additional helpful resources. Uh, it, uh, it, can, it, it can be used in combination with the ICAO SAF rules of thumb that I'll briefly mention later today, and it's all publicly available on the AK website. I invite you to take a look on those, like it's very uh, useful material. So on the next slide, just uh, like, uh, I, I won't go into detail of everything here, but just to highlight like that the guidance provides details on 28 types of policy options 
that are divided into three impact areas and eight categories. So the impact areas like stimulating growth of SAF supply, creating demand for SAF, and enabling SAF markets. So there we have like a variety of policies that uh, support these uh, in impact areas. And we'll be seeing many examples of these uh, policies today. So uh, we, it's, it's, it will be good to see these, these options in practice by our RICAO member states later today. So next slide, please. So uh, the rules of thumb, uh, so this can also be used like to support policy decisions. The rules of thumb provide order of magnitude estimations on safe costs, investments needs and production potential, and they can be used to inform policy maker and, and project developers. So this is the kind of information that we have on the, on the rules of thumb, like the uh, estimates on total capital investments uh, for safe uh, de development, feedstock costs, feedstock yield, minimum selling price and refinery capacity. So this can be used by, uh, to support eventual policy decisions. So next slide. And, and we also have the SAF policy tracker where uh, the, all the policies that are being developed by member states are listed and uh, we have links for further details uh, in our website, like directing to the uh, websites from our ICAO member states that are developing uh, SAF policies. So uh, next slide, please. So with that, uh, I would like to hand it over to our first speaker, so which will be uh, Mr. Daniel uh, NG from Singapore. So Daniel, can you, uh, are you there? Yes, hi, Bruno, thank you. Okay, great, so the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks, Bruno, and thank you to IKEA for this invitation to share this access seminar. Um, Daniel from the Civil Aviation Authority of Singapore. I'm also the Chief Sustainability Officer for CAS, where we look at setting the sustainability strategy for the Singapore aviation sector. So in brief, what we are doing right now in Singapore is that we are looking at developing a sustainable air hub in Singapore. Uh, what we believe is that sustainable aviation must uh, not mean uh, less flying or flying or no flying, but really it's about flying more sustainably. So on our part, we are developing a sustainable air hub blueprint uh, with clear targets and pathways. Uh, and this will form the basis of our revised state action plan that we'll uh, submit to ICAO later this year. So the intention of this blueprint is really to establish clear targets and pathways for the Singapore aviation sector to build Singapore as a sustainable air hub. We are looking at uh, the pathways around three uh, large domains, the airport, airline, and ATM, and as well as uh, key enablers such as policy and regulation, manpower development, infrastructure, and technology. Uh, to help us with this effort, uh, next slide, please. We have convened uh, last year an international advisory panel on the sustainable air hub. Uh, what we believe is that the best ideas actually are not just from within CS or within Singapore, but from across the world. Uh, so we were able to bring together uh, the leaders and thought leaders from various uh, sectors. So uh, from international organizations such as ACI, uh, Cancel as well as IATA, um, also knowledge partners from across the, the uh, private and public sector, including local research institutions in Singapore, uh, consulting firms, as well as the World Economic Forum. On the next slide, you'll find our industry partners and what we call technology partners. Uh, so Neste, which is uh, just going to open its SAF facility in Singapore next month, uh, or in May, sorry, as well as industry partners such as Airbus, uh, Rolls-Royce, Singapore Airlines, Thales, Boeing, as well as our old local Singapore uh, stakeholders such as the Changi Airport Group and Singapore Airlines. So the entire IP had helped us uh, develop a set of recommendations, which you can see on the next slide. Uh, this report actually is available on our website, which you can go and download. And in brief, what the IAP had recommended for us uh, is 15 recommendations uh, around the three domains as shown, airport, airline, ATM. And the, most of the recommendations around SAF actually sit within the airline domain in the middle, uh, which I will go into further detail later. 
And as mentioned, we also saw there was a need to do enablers, uh, policy and regulation, industry development, infrastructure planning and provision and workforce transformation. And these are actually quite critical uh, when we talk about developing SAF policies and encouraging the use of SAF in the aviation sector. Next slide. So this um, basically talks about the, our approach and the in terms of the recommendations that the IAP has given to us. Uh, we see uh, the key challenge of tackling uh, SAF demand and supply has to be done through uh, uh, setting up an ecosystem. So this has to come with complementary strategies, both tackling the supply of SAF as well as the demand of SAF, as well as creating enablers to support <clears throat> how SAF is being accounted, measured, and uh, tracked. So we'll go into further details later, but in terms of just broadly, in terms of supply, we're looking at developing a roadmap for a long-term secure supply system, ecosystem in Singapore and in Southeast Asia. Uh, for demand, we're looking at developing a corporate bias club uh, to tap lead demand, as well as developing a structural offtake mechanism. Then in terms of enablers, we're really looking at how we form markets and allow for good accounting of carbon offsets as well as uh, SAF uh, credits to allow for uh, a robust system uh, marketplace to happen. And finally, if you look at the technical center, this is longer term, where we look at uh, positioning Singapore as an early adopter of aircraft technology. Next slide, please. So just to share uh, how we have started this journey on uh, encouraging the use of SAF in Singapore. Uh, our first step was actually also last year where we uh, had our initial SAF pilot in Singapore, where we partnered Singapore Airlines, uh, the Masek, our state investment company, uh, CAG, the Changi Airport Group, ExxonMobil and Neste to conduct a SAF pilot at Changi Airport. There were actually two objectives to this pilot. Uh, first, we wanted to test the operational uh, aspects of bringing SAF into Singapore Changi Airport. So we looked at how we can bring lead SAF and we were uh, had, uh, had it blended offsite uh, in a facility within Singapore. It was tankered to, uh, to Changi and then uplifted through the fuel hydrant system. So we were able to prove that actually operationally there were no issue uh, bringing SAF into Changi Airport. The second part of this uh, pilot, uh, which is perhaps the more important part, is really to test the sale of SAF credits. Uh, so the credits that were generated by this SAF that were brought in, uh, these were then sold on to corporate and individual, tra uh, individual travelers. Uh, it was uh, an opportunity for us to test out what was the demand for these SAF credits so that we could understand uh, demand patterns as well as willingness to pay among the stakeholders and consumers within Singapore. And what we found that Actually, some of the demand users actually came from the local financial institutions who are looking to reduce their scope three emissions, as well as cargo shippers uh, looking to decarbonize their supply chain. And we are going to take these learnings uh, and adopt them into our future studies, which I will elaborate later in the next slide. So next slide, please. So in terms of self-supply, uh, we wanted to first tackle this issue of supply uh, because we believe that it is important that we secure uh, a long-term supply of SAF, uh, not just for Changi Airport, but also within our region, because without a supply of SAF, it is very hard for us to be able to encourage uh, demand. So right now we are doing uh, work to start to develop a roadmap to create a long-term SAF supply in the region, as well as in Singapore. And a key piece of that work is to really validate uh, the feedstock that's widely available within the region uh, to align them with global standards and to see how we can encourage greater use of feedstock that's available in the region and also new investments in new set pathways. Um, moving ahead, we are also working uh, and participating in a regional study uh, that's led by Boeing and RSP, the round table on sustainable biomaterials to really look at the potential uh, for set feedstock within ASEAN uh, or the countries within Southeast Asia, the 10 countries within ASEAN. Uh, so we are bringing this uh, in through uh, a cross-sectoral stakeholder group involving the reg regulators, the financial institutions, uh, traditional fuel producers, as well as airlines and non-traditional producers to look at how we can uh, look at the potential opportunities for ASEAN to be a bigger player in producing SAF. And we hope to share the results of the study uh, probably next year uh, when it is completed. 
Next slide. So on the demand side, um, what we are looking at is how to create a sustained demand. Um, I think it's important, as we all know, to create opportunities for a, a certainty to investors, to signal to investors that there is demand for SAM and there is opportunities in investing in SAM production. Uh, so we are looking at how we can uh, design what we call a structural optic mechanism. Uh, the idea is that we want to develop through policy a sustained demand for SAF at Changi Airport uh, that allows us to secure long-term supply at, uh, at long-term prices. Uh, but of course, we also have to consider the unique context and characteristics of the Singapore Air Hub, which is fully international. We don't have any domestic uh, aviation. So we have to assess what is the impact on our carriers, uh, the impact on uh, travel demand and the impact on competitiveness. And this is a study that we are undertaking and we're just about to start uh, this quarter and we hope to complete it uh, sometime in the middle of this year. And again, uh, once we have uh, completed that study, we'd be quite happy to share uh, our findings at this forum as well. Next slide. Uh, to continue on that, I think uh, beyond just an optic uh, mechanism, we also believe that there is, uh, there are lead, uh, demand users, uh, people with higher willingness to pay. And Singapore is well placed to tap on that demand uh, because we are a big business hub. Uh, there are a lot of international firms with headquarters or regional headquarters in Singapore. Um, we hope to be able to tap on these uh, lead demand, not just within Singapore, but also within the Southeast Asia region to form a pious club. So that in addition to the demand uh, created by the optic mechanism, we can also tap on this larger demand, uh, including potentially also uh, the Singapore government and public sector agencies as well, to increase the potential pool of funds that could be used to buy SAF for Singapore. So we are also commencing a study onto this uh, corporate bias club model, and we hope to also share these results uh, when this become available uh, later in this year. Next slide. So beyond the supply and demand side strategies, uh, we also believe that it's important for us to build supporting mechanisms. Um, so a key part of that is really about uh, the, the marketplace for the credits, uh, not just those generated by SEF, but also more generally uh, carbon credits. Because we believe that in order for uh, SEF to take off, uh, we need to have a clear marketplace that allows for the reliable uh, tracking, tracing and, account and accounting of SAF offsets as well as carbon credits. And we hope to work with our uh, sister agencies in the Singapore uh, Monetary Authority of Singapore to see how we can create uh, uh, and tap on their strategy to build Singapore as a carbon, carbon services hub to create this marketplace for aviation carbon offsets. Uh, we have also looked at uh, international partnerships um, we think that there is an opportunity as this is a field that's fairly nascent uh, for like-minded partners to come together and work on creating a demand for SAF and the use of SAF in international air travel. Uh, so we have established partnerships with the US, uh, FAA, uh, DOT, uh, Australia, New Zealand, and Japan, uh, GCAB, uh, to look at how we can look at greater uh, cooperation and knowledge exchange on SAF policies as well as the potential concept of a, a green lane uh, involving end-to-end uh, -end partners so that we can validate how uh, sustainable aviation uh, could evolve, uh, especially through the use of, or through the greater use of SAF. So again, this is work that's ongoing and with our international partners, we hope to be able to provide updates uh, subsequently. Uh, next slide. So that really concludes the presentation and I'm happy to take questions later. Thank you very much, Daniel. Like it's really impressive, like the amount, the number of uh, stakeholders that you guys are coordinating with, like both domestically, internationally, right? Like, I guess th that this is key, right? Like we'll be seeing that in the other areas as well, but this is key for self-development. Like there are a lot of stakeholders involved and thank you very much for sharing your experiences. Uh, and uh, yeah, let, let's wait for the questions then in the Q&A. So with that, like uh, I'd like to invite our next speaker, uh, speakers actually, right? Like which are uh, Mr. Nathan Brown and Mr. Arnold Doni from the United States, who will share also their experiences on on United States policies. Yeah. 
So Nate, uh, the floor is yours. Are you there? Good morning, Bruno. Good morning. Thanks very much. Can you hear me? Yes, perfect. Okay. okay. Uh, good. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with you this this morning for me. Um, and I'm going to give the overview of the uh, the U.S. approach to policy making related to sustainable aviation fuels. Uh, just just to start off, I'll introduce myself. I am a SAF project manager within the U.S. FAA's Office of Environment and Energy. Uh, we're the principal office that's responsible for setting domestic and international policy standards, uh, as well as conducting quite a bit of, of research and development uh, into solutions for aviation's environmental problems, including for sustainable aviation fuels. Um, I think what I intend to do here is to, to give uh, an overview of our interagency efforts, of our uh, programs that are supporting SAF policy, um, and, and to give you a sense of how um, uh, across uh, stakeholders uh, we're working uh, to support uh, sustainable aviation fuel uh, supply chain development and, and uh, demand and, and production. Next slide, please. So the overarching policy document that sets the U.S. strategy is the U.S. Aviation Climate Action Plan. Uh, this was released on November 9th, uh, 2021 uh, by our Secretary of Transportation, Pete Buttigieg. Um, and it gives a whole of government approach to putting the aviation sector on a path toward achieving net zero emissions by, by 2050. This is an ambitious goal uh, and it's one that uh, has been done and set uh, based on analysis of the potential paths to getting there. So it is ambitious, but it's also a plan that lays out uh, an approach uh, that, can, uh, that can get us to this ambitious goal. It builds also on industry-wide commitments that had already been made, uh, and it was accompanied by additional commitments made, about, made by our industry and stakeholders. And the plan highlights specific actions and policy measures that will help uh, to foster innovation and drive change across uh, the industry. Next slide, please. So this comes right from the, the Climate Action Plan, uh, and it's based on analysis that we've done on the impact of the basket of measures uh, on our goal uh, for U.S. aviation. So this is U.S. domestic and, and U.S. international aviation. Uh, and you can see what a critical role drop-in sustainable aviation fuel technology plays here. The, the green wedges that you see, which make up the majority of the, uh, of the carbon intensity reductions uh, come from SAF. So we, we face the challenge that technology and the diffusion of, of, of technology based on uh, general improvements that are happening in the aviation industry, those do provide a significant wedge. And you see that in the red, in the red wedge there. But new aircraft technologies are also needed. One of the challenges there is that the diffusion, the development of those technologies takes place over decades uh, and the diffusion of those technologies into the fleet uh, takes time as well. And so you see that that blue wedge is not as big of an impact as we might hope. Operational improvements provide a, a limited impact, but it's really SAF uh, that provides the biggest uh, reductions in carbon intensity in the timeframes, in the near-term timeframes that we're talking about, 2030 and 2050. Next slide, please. So as a part of this approach, uh, we've built on a number of years of cooperation within the U.S. government across a number of different agencies uh, to uh, sign an agreement led by the Departments of Transportation and FAA, the Department of Energy, and the U.S. Department of Agriculture uh, to work together to take a government-wide approach to expanding the production of SAF, reducing the costs of SAF, and enhancing SAF sustainability. We've set goals of having 3 billion gallons of domestic SAF production by 2030, just seven years away, and putting US, the US on a trajectory to achieving 35 billion gallons per year by 2050, which is expected to meet our anticipated uh, jet fuel demand uh, by 2050. So 100% of our, of our use. SAF being developed and considered under this program need to achieve at a minimum a 50% reduction in life cycle greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, as compared to conventional jet fuel. Uh, but the intent really is to drive down uh, the carbon intensity of these fuels and these fuel pathways uh, through a number of means um, and enhance their sustainability further. And then finally, one of the key outcomes so far in the SAF Grand Challenge 
uh, which was announced in September of 2021, was the development of a multi-agency roadmap to focus federal actions and to support uh, the scale up of SAF production by industry. This SAF Grand Challenge Roadmap was released uh, this, this past September, September 2022, after about a year of, of development and consultation with stakeholders. And it sets out a roadmap that focuses federal actions to support industry scale up by de-risking technologies, by enabling innovation in, in new SAF production technologies, by de-risking supply chains, by enabling SAF markets, and by reducing barriers to uh, production and development of, of SAF supply. The roadmap does this by leveraging existing government activities in research development, demonstration, and deployment of SAF, by accelerating new, identifying and accelerating new research development, demonstration, deployment uh, activities that are needed, and by implementing a supporting uh, policy framework. All of these actions are intended to address key, the key challenges that we've identified, which is cost, clearly the, the fact that SAF are more expensive than, than petroleum fuels, and that costs need to be reduced, to continue to enhance the sustainability of these fuels, to make sure that they are continually reducing their carbon intensity and that incentives are put in place uh, to make sure that carbon intensity uh, comes down over time, uh, and to expand the supply, to build the infrastructure uh, that will enable expanded a supply of SAF to meet the goals and the needs that we, we have. Next slide, please. So the roadmap is structured into six action areas that are laid out here. Uh, feedstock innovation, uh, this is led primarily by our U.S. Department of, of Agriculture, and it's focused on supporting and conducting research and development on SAF supply uh, systems, SAF supply chains that enable innovations uh, across feedstocks, across the range of, of uh, potential materials that can be utilized for SAF, and this includes waste, it includes purpose-grown crops, it, in, it includes waste gases and sources of CO2, and to identify opportunities to optimize uh, across those supply chains and, and reduce cost, enhance sustainability, enable greater production, and improve yield. The con Conversion Technology Innovation Action Area is led by our Department of Energy, and it's focused on supporting and conducting research and development for SAF conversion processes that are either already commercial, so optimizing those, those uh, SAF production technologies that are being commercialized now, as well as developing additional and essentially a pipeline of SAF production technologies that can support the needs beyond uh, the 2030 goal and out to 2050. The Building Supply Chains Action Area is focused on supporting SAF production expansion through the development of supply chains, regional supply chains in different parts of the United States. Through demonstration projects, the validation of, of uh, supply chain logistics, by enabling public-private partnerships, and by engaging and supporting uh, regional, state, and local uh, local stakeholders uh, that are working to develop SAF supply. The policy and valuation analysis action area is focused on providing data, tools, and analysis to support policy decisions as well as conducting uh, analysis of both existing and potential new policies uh, that can support SAF production. The enabling end use action area is focused on facilitating the end use of SAF by addressing critical barriers to the certification and qualification of SAF, by expanding uh, existing blend limits beyond the current 50% limit uh, and up to 100% use of, of, of sustainable aviation fuel and by focusing on projects that can help to integrate SAF into the fuel distribution infrastructure and addressing obstacles uh, that are encountered there. And then finally, the communicating progress and building support work stream is all about engaging our stakeholders, monitoring and measuring progress that we make against the SAF Grand Challenge goals, providing public information uh, resources and communicating the benefits of, of the SAF Grand Challenge and of sustainable aviation fuels. So within these six action areas, we have uh, more detailed components uh, that are in, in, the, in the roadmap, including 26 uh, work streams. And within those 26 work streams, there are 139 specific activities that have been identified. Some of these activities are, are most relevant for the 2030 timeframe and the 3 billion gallon goal and focus on near-term technologies and commercialization and, and build out of, of, of uh, supply chain infrastructure. And other technologies are focused on innovation that gets us from 2030 to 2050 
and impacts the 2050 uh, time frame and goal. Next slide, please. So in terms of next steps on the implementation of the SAF Grand Challenge, there's an interagency team that's been working together uh, to, uh, to build on, on the activities identified in the roadmap. One of the first things that we've done is to publish a SAF Grand Challenge website, which is our primary portal for sharing information about progress uh, and resources that come out of the SAF Grand Challenge. Uh, there's the link there uh, to the website. Uh, this was just launched this past month. And it is going to be the place where we will uh, continue to update and to provide information and to gather feedback from stakeholders uh, on activities of the SAF Grand Challenge. Since the publication of the roadmap in, in, uh, in September, the federal agencies have been working uh, on an inventory of federal activities uh, that matches up against the, the activities that are, um, that are detailed in the roadmap, essentially filling out the roadmap and identifying where there are gaps uh, in that roadmap. We've also been engaging stakeholders and subject matter experts on each of the er these areas to make sure uh, that uh, we've uh, captured uh, the fundamental uh, challenges and fundamental opportunities to, to address. And we're continuing and we will plan to continue uh, to share updates on these progress and to engage with our stakeholders uh, for feedback, as well as to identify and map industry supported or stakeholder supported and funded efforts that align with activities in the roadmap. We will be uh, publishing a uh, annual progress report uh, in September. Our first one is planned for this coming September uh, to uh, continue to uh, report on progress and, uh, and gather input uh, from stakeholders. Next slide, please. So the next two slides talk about an exciting additional component to the overall policy efforts in the United States. So while uh, the uh, Climate Action Plan sets the overall goals and the SAF Grand Challenge uh, roadmap uh, sets federal agency activities, uh, we have a third component that's critical and important uh, that's driving forward our SAF efforts, and that's the creation of incentives and support uh, for expansion of SAF, and in particular in the Inflation Reduction Act, which was passed this past summer uh, and signed into law by President Biden uh, in August. We have two components that are directly targeting and supporting uh, SAF production. And in particular, there are, are tax credits and production credits. So essentially five years of support uh, in two different credits. The first, the SAF tax credit, which is set up for two years uh, between 2023 and 2024. Uh, it achieves, it, it focuses on fuels that will achieve uh, at a minimum of 50% life cycle greenhouse gas uh, emissions reduction. If you achieve 50% greenhouse gas reduction, you get $1.25 uh, credit per gallon of SAF, of NEAT SAF. If your uh, greenhouse gas reduction is beyond that, you can get uh, an additional amount up to $1.75 for a fuel that achieves 100% life cycle greenhouse gas emissions reduction. So it's set up to encourage increasing innovation, increasing reduction in carbon intensity. And it also achieves a very significant goal, which is to put the production of sustainable aviation fuels on par in an economic sense uh, with the production of other fuels, including renewable diesel, uh, which has been supported for road transportation. Beginning in 2025 and, and through 2027, there's a production tax credit, uh, which uh, is uh, not SAF specific, but it does provide an enhanced value for sustainable avi aviation fuels, again, up to $1.75 for 100% reduction. Uh, there's more detail on the text of the of the legislation uh, in the link uh, that's there below. And one thing I want to note here is that there is a tie here to uh, the work of ICAO and, and ICAO Corsia. Uh, the uh, legislation recognizes as one of the potential ways of, uh, of evaluating the, the life cycle greenhouse gas reductions of fuels that might qualify for this tax credit, recognizes the ICAO Corsia uh, methodology for greenhouse gas life cycle analysis and the default values that are included in that methodology. Next slide, please. The second component of the Inflation Reduction Act that, that's really significant and it's one that's being managed out of the Department of Transportation and our office at, at the Federal Aviation Administration is a, a new uh, clean technology grant program. Uh, what we're calling the uh, FAST grant program, the Fueling Aviation Sustainable Transition or FAST program. 
It's contained in section 4007 of the legislation and it provides uh, $245 million for a competitive grant program that will uh, focus on <clears throat> projects in the US that produce, transport, blend, or store sustainable aviation fuels. This is a significant program and component to supporting uh, essentially the integration of SAF into the uh, supply chain infrastructure, uh, as well as uh, providing uh, incentives and support for potential SAF producers to utilize and leverage their existing infrastructure uh, to produce uh, sustainable aviation fuel in the case where they're producing, for example, uh, just surface transportation fuels. We held a, a public meeting and session on December 14th um, uh, of the past year uh, to gather information from stakeholders. Uh, and uh, we are busily right now working on developing the notice of funding opportunity uh, that will come out uh, in, uh, in the summer uh, for awards that we hope will be made uh, later, later this year. Next slide, please. So this is my last slide. It's sort of the, the wrap up and wanted to, to give a sense of how we see the pieces fitting together uh, for um, the US policy environment. The first task and, and, and a significant challenge is to create an environment where producers choose to produce and sell sustainable aviation fuels. We know that SAF face challenges in terms of their economics and their costs, uh, as well as uh, the risk uh, for investors to invest in the infrastructure and, and, and production capability. One of the ways that that's being done in the US of, of creating this environment is legislative action that's focused on reducing costs and reducing risk. And we see that through the Inflation Reduction Act uh, activities that, I, that I've outlined in previous slides. We also see a, a critical part of the path to success is a coordinated approach by the federal agencies that fund uh, actions that can help to de-risk technologies that can support supply chain development, uh, that enable markets and, and that reduce barriers. Uh, we've uh, done that through the SAF Grand Challenge Roadmap, laying out actions that will support the near-term production goal, uh, laying out actions that uh, enable innovation to support uh, longer-term production, and then also um, actions that support the development uh, of uh, strong and, and, um, and focused policies that create uh, both SAF production, but also maintain and ensure sustainability of that SAF production. And then the final component, and not a government role, but one that we hope through the conditions being set uh, by the previous two uh, activities, is industry action to support SAF production. Uh, the purchasing, essentially, of SAF by operators, uh, the production of SAF by, by fuel producers, the production of feedstock by supply chain participants. Um, and we have in the US very significant commitments on the part of industry, on the part of our airlines, on the part of fuel producers, SAF producers, uh, to meet the goals of the SAF Grand Challenge, the 3 billion gallons by 2030 and, and 35 by, by 2050. Uh, and so we're working and, and, and uh, pushing forward together in the same direction. I think that's my final slide. And you can flip to the next. I think it's, uh, yep, that was my final slide. I look forward to the, the Q&A. Uh, and thanks, uh, thanks very much for the opportunity. Thanks, Nate. Yeah, again, like very impressive, like the, the number of uh, initiatives that you guys are hosting, like, and uh, just in line with our colleague from Singapore. So I just like to highlight here, like the two points you mentioned, like on the state action plan and on the and on the use of course CM methodologies, right? So, so these are internationally agreed processes, like, and they can also be used, like, as you guys use it for the United States situation, this is available, like, for all the IKO member states to to leverage the, the, the activities at ICAO in a domestic environment. And we really welcome like this example that the United States is setting. And we expect like a lot of information on SAF to be coming now like on the State Action Plans Initiative. So thank you very much. Like, and I'm sure like we'll have like some good questions on the, for the Q&A session. So thanks. Uh, and so with that, like we'll, we can go to our next speaker, which is going to be uh, Ms. Iwa One from the European Commission. So you were, uh, are you there? Can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear me as well? Yes. Perfect. Okay. Yes. So the floor is yours. Thank you. Yes. Hello, everyone. And I would like to present um, the, the SAF actions that we are taking at the uh, European Union level. And if we can proceed with the slides. 
Yes, so let me first provide um, the policy context. So we have in, in, in the EU, we have European Green Deal, which is a flagship initiative, and it sets um, uh, an aim to, uh, for EU to be climate neutral by 2050. Um, to get to that long-term uh, goal, uh, we have set intermediate uh, targets to ensure that we are on the, on the right path, uh, which is to reduce the emissions uh, at least uh, by 55% by 2030, uh, below the 90, uh, 1990 uh, baseline. Um, with this ambitious uh, objective, uh, all economic sectors will need to contribute to that, uh, including um, aviation. We all know that aviation is very hard to decarbonize. There is a high potential of SAF to contribute to this um, to, to aviation decarbonization, and with Altag report, we see important role it will play. Uh, however, we still have a low um, a low production and uptake of SAF. So that's why we came with the Refuel EU Aviation Initiative to how to break this uh, vicious cycle um, of the supply and demand and, and kick off um, the SAF, uh, SAF production and availability in Europe. Uh, so in the next slide, um, I outlined uh, three, basically three pillars. Um, so first is the, um, the regulatory uh, pillar. This is the, um, the legislation, uh, regulation that we have proposed. Um, which is currently in the negotiations. Uh, in Europe, we go via Parliament and based on com European Commission proposal, it goes to European Parliament and the Council for the negotiations, uh, which are currently ongoing and, and being in the last stages. So we expect uh, the adoption uh, um, still this year. Uh, so I will focus first on, on the regulation. Uh, we also have another, uh, other uh, accompanying measures more to support from the industrial uh, dimension and as well, uh, of course, the in, uh, international dimension. Um, so let me, for, on the next slide, let me uh, explain uh, our leg, um, regulatory uh, proposal. Uh, it has two objectives. So first of all, is to ramp up the SAF production and as such, uh, of course, decarbonize uh, aviation. And, uh, and then as well, we have a second um, objective equally important, which considers um, considering that aviation is, um, is a global uh, sector, which is subject to high competition. So it's very important is to maintain the level playing field. Uh, so that's why we came with the harmonized European approach um, in defining the, the obligations related uh, with the soft supply. And I would like to now on the next slide, I would like to guide you more on the on the details, uh, on the features um, uh, of this uh, proposal. Um, so basically that we are proposing a, a binding minimum uh, soft shares, uh, of, uh, which has to be provided uh, across the EU by fewer suppliers in the aviation um, uh, fuel mix that they provide. And as you can see in this uh, table, we start the first mandates already start in 2025, and we give a project trajectory uh, up to 2050. We just we just slower uh, start at the beginning and, and more ramp up uh, as the time pro uh, progresses. And we have a dedicated sub target for synthetic fuels um, to to in particular to to stimulate as well and support uh, production uh, of this um, type of fuel. Um, this this ramp up and and, and setting this um, this mandate um, will help to bring the market certainty. It will guarantee the uh, uh, the supply the supply will have to be guaranteed so that it will help with the soft production and will help to cut this uh, vicious cycle that I mentioned. And as well as we get the more volumes, uh, we will we will also. Um, this will allow economies of scale, efficiency, and to bring, uh, make SAF most cost, uh, more cost competitive. Um, in terms of the, the, the what is actually SAF, uh, so we have, um, uh, in our proposal, uh, it covers the biofuels, so the waste and, and, and the residues, uh, and as well, uh, synthetic aviation fuels from produced from renewable hydrogen. However, what is important to note that as the negotiations are ongoing currently, um, this, um, th in particular, those features are being intensively discussed. So there is this likely that it will uh, further uh, evolve. And as for the sustainability, we, we rely on the renewable energy um, directive. 
uh, then next slide, please. Um, so what are the obligations um, of, this, uh, of this legislation? So we have uh, three main actors, uh, aviation fuel suppliers, who has to supply those minimum shares of SAF as per this table uh, uh, presented. Um, those will have to be supplied across uh, EU airports. We have uh, aircraft uh, operators which depart from EU airports. They will um, they have to uplift uh, fuel at uh, EU airports uh, without uh, tankering practices. And we have uh, EU airports. This would not apply to the small airports. There are some exclusions, the same as for for aircraft operators. There are some exclusions for the ones which are have low um, number of movements during the year. Um, so. As it concerns airports, um, they will have to guarantee access to refueling infrastructure with a SAS as a drop in fuel. We don't expect um, difficulty there. Uh, um, so now I would move. So it's um, can we have the next slide, please? Um, so, so this was the legislative proposal. I outlined the key features. So, as I said, it is um, now in the final stage of the of the legislative process. Um, uh, so, things may may still evolve. Um, in parallel to this legislative proposal, this as I called uh, the the second pillar, we have these industrial measures, and here is to um, to to help to bring the SAV in this transitional as we're scaling up um, to to make it more uh, affordable, uh, reduce the price gap. Um, so we have different um, different initiative here. Mm, so first of all, what I would focus uh, is the financing. So here we have a uh, financing um, at the EU level. Um, there are various programs um, to support um, from the research stage to, to demonstrations, to the scale up uh, on the production side. Um, but as well, what we have more recently um, proposed is under uh, EU emissions trading system is the, uh, we, we, we call those uh, SAF allowances. So these are um, the allowances which will be paid to uh, air airlines, which are covered under the scope of the UETS, to, and it will help to narrow down the price gap between the fossil fuel and, and SAF. So the, it is a construct, uh, like um, contracts for difference. Uh, uh, and there will be quite substantial funding uh, with um, depending exact on the on the carbon price, but it's it's up to two billion euros. Um, we as well we have uh, the stated rules, revised stated rules, which will help to support SAF uh, SAF production and and, and can pro and uptake. So the member states they can provide uh, tax exemptions, grants, and so on. Um, we have also other uh, other revisions of the um, uh, of other legislations um, like uh, emissions trading system, where is the strengthened carbon price, um, energy taxation directive, where we remove the jet fuel um, tax on the intra EU flights. Uh, so this will also strengthen the price signal and help to narrow the price gap. Um, what other initiatives we have? We have also launched a uh, SAF clearinghouse uh, pilot um, that there uh, it, it can help to accelerate the bringing up new SAF production pathways to the market uh, by helping the fuel producers uh, through the quality fuel qualification uh, process. We have as well last year, we have launched uh, Industrial Alliance. So this is a stakeholders driven initiative where we have all stakeholders along the value chain. So the, the full name is Renewable and Low Carbon Fuels Value Chain Industrial Alliance. It's open to participation to anyone uh, who is interested. Um, and there is to the industry um, looking at the, um, uh, what are the bottlenecks, what, what actions to, to overcome them building pipeline of project. Also important to, to when we did the impact assessment, um, we uh, we estimated that we need more than 100 uh, new SAF plants to meet the objectives, uh, the, the ramp up that, that I presented. Uh, so that's quite a lot of uh, industrial action and investments will be needed. Uh, so that's why we also want to bring uh, all stake industrial stakeholders um, together. 
And uh, very, very recent developments, we have also, the um, uh, Commission has adopted a proposal for Net Zero Industry Act uh, to strengthen net zero technology uh, products manufacturing ecosystem. So there, uh, SAF is identified as the net zero technology, which um, this, this act aims to uh, to improve the framework conditions uh, for the manufacturing and, for example, like uh, related with the permissions, uh, accelerating the permission process, improving the skills uh, frameworks and access to finding. Um, and then I would like to move to my last slide where I will uh, uh, this, um, explain on the on the international uh, dimension. So. Um, in the EU, uh, the EU fully supports uh, the long-term aspirational goal, which was agreed at the last assembly, and is fully committed to, uh, to support SAF production around the world. Uh, we have capacity building uh, projects. Um, over the last decade, we, uh, we financed uh, over um, 20 million. Um, and now there is an upcoming project of 4 million under ACTSAF, uh, which will be implemented with ICAO and EASA uh, uh, with the funding for um, uh, Africa, India, um, Egypt. And there, there will be feasibility studies and, and uh, providing support for the policy development to foster SAF. So thank you. I outlined these three different pillars, this legislative proposal, industrial action and international, what we are pursuing uh, at the European Union level. And um, in case you have any questions, <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm, I'm open. Thank you very much. Thank you very well, like yeah, and and thank you like for all this coordination that uh, the EU is having like with ICAO, like that's great, and like you also mentioned like the in your first slides like the level playing field that you're trying to establish like at the European level, like this is also like in line with what how I mentioned like in the first slides like the the ICAO vision uh, 2050, asking specifically for this kind of level playing field, so it will be great to just discuss this further later in this year like in the CAF three like what are the initiatives can be, be taken like at a global level to ensure this level playing field that indeed like is going to be very important for a global ramp up of self production and deployment. So thank you very much. Yeah, I can see already some questions coming up for you there like, and but and we'll have also, we'll also come back to those questions like later in the Q and A session. But if that like, uh, I'd like to move there to our next uh, speaker, which is uh, Ms. Marcelo Anselmi from Brazil who will be giving the, the Brazilian experiences on, on SAF and biofuels. And so Marcela, the floor is yours. Can you, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Thank you so much, Bruno. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to you all. Uh, my name is Marcela Anselmi. I'm the head of the International and Environmental Office here at the Brazilian Civil Aviation Agency. And I'm very glad to share with you some of the Brazilians, the Brazilian, um, thoughts, I would say, on a policy to, to foster SAF production here. Next slide, please. So when we look to Brazil, we see a huge potential uh, for SAF production. Uh, we already have a long and rich tr tradition on biofuel production for ground transportation. It dates back to the 70s. Uh, this policy was very successful. And today we have like a blending a uh, mix in the traditional fuel in the gasoline of 27%. And in, even for more heavy ground transportation, we, are, we also have a policy for a mandate of, uh, um, for mandatory mixing that goes from 10 to 12% in the case of diesel. So, um, and when we look at the feedstocks and the potential for production in Brazil uh, for biofuels in general, uh, it's a enormous. We have a diversity of feedbacks. We have a, a, the technology to produce it. And some feasibility studies shows that, for example, we can meet 100% of the demand for domestic and international flights from the Brazilian airlines only with uh, agriculture and forest uh, waste. So this is huge. And if you look at the next uh, slide, this uh, potential can be seen uh, in the metrics in the Brazilian electricity supply. 
and as well as in, uh, in our energy supply. So for example, in the electricity, we have more than 80% non-fossil fuels, uh, non-fossil energy uh, sources. And in the case of uh, biomass, it's almost 8%, in more than 8%. And in our total energy supply, it's almost 50-50, it's 46% non-fossil, but it goes up and down. So it's more than, it's a half of our energy supply. And um, the biomass has also a, a, a huge impact. It's almost 16, 17% that comes from biomass. Uh, please, if you go to the next slide. Uh, this put Brazil in a very good position internationally in terms of our energy metrics. Uh, Brazil is one of the cleanest and more renewable, um, has one of the more, most renewable sources in, in, the, in the world. But uh, the question is, having all this background, all this policy behind us, uh, how can we foster SAF? And please, the next slide. So how can we make use of this tradition in policies and this great potential to, to have safer airlines? And please, next slide. So in 2021, uh, we came up with a committee uh, at the government level to try to put in place a very comprehensive policy, not only based on um, aviation, but a policy that would include other means of transportation uh, to take into account um, the impact that one policy could have on the others, to have a, a fair uh, level playing field between the different modes of transportation. So the Ministry of Mines and Energy instituted this technical committee, which is called Fuel for the Future, um, in order to, to propose a very integrated and balanced clean energy policy in Brazil. It, it would include not only aviation, but the maritime and the ground transportation as well. And for each of those uh, branches, a subcommittee was uh, also instituted. And we have like the SAF subcommittee with the participation, and please the next slide, with a very uh, high number of stakeholders from the government, so all the government bodies in some way on, or the other involved in this discussion, the civil aviation agency, the energy agency, the ministries of energy, of environment, of infrastructure, and any other stakeholder that would have an impact, that would be impacted by this policy was, were invited. But uh, having the government was not enough. So uh, we try to have the whole system together to discuss ways to move forward. Because in the, the Brazilian case, we knew that we it wouldn't be enough just to reproduce, to replicate what we have done in the past for the aviation. The aviation sector is very specific. It has very unique characteristics in terms of technical standards, but also um, in a country like Brazil, where, where the territory is huge, we need to take into account logistics as well. So we invited airports, airlines, uh, manufacturers. Brazil has one aircraft manufacturer in Braer, but we invited also the uh, um, uh, Boeing and Airbus because they, the Brazilian market is uh, important for them. Um, this for was for the, let's say, the aviation sector, but we broadened the, this scope. We invited as well um, the supply side, so the main uh, biofuel produce, producers in Brazil, the certificate uh, enter, uh, companies for this kind of fuel and uh, research centers may need to see what we can do, what's the feasibility, um, what's the most feasible production in Brazil to have this broadened um, discussion. And of course, uh, one side that was very important is to bring together with us, uh, the financing side. In Brazil, we have constraints on a policy that would use, would be, be dependent on uh, public funding. So how can we um, invite other players to see the potential of this market and invest in this market in here in, in our country? Next slide, please. So from all of those discussions, it took us more than six months uh, with almost uh, one uh, meeting per week 
to have all of those aspects of what would be needed in terms of regulatory framework, taxation, uh, financing, research and development. And uh, after those six months of intensive work, pub consultation workshops and wide discussions, we came up with final conclusions um, and they were the basis for a draft proposal that was uh, carried out by the Ministry of Mines and Energy with the support of the aviation sector and with the support of the Brazilian Civil Aviation Authority. Next slide, please. And here I want to share with you some of the main conclusions, the main pillars of this uh, draft uh, policy that is still under discussion um, here in Brazil. But uh, some of the aspects of this draft are very technical and we believe here in the, the Civil Aviation Authority that it's a good uh, basis for moving forward uh, considering all the specificities in the, of the Brazilian case. So the first one, was uh, the mandate. So when we look at the other um, international uh, benchmarking cases, we see that you can have um, subsidies, direct investment from the government in this industry. You can have uh, blending mandates. But um, as I said, uh, there is no one fit for all solution. And the Brazilian case was very unique in this, uh, in this sense because we have constraints from the budgetary point of view, and we also have constraints on a mixing, um, on a blending mandate. Uh, because we have more than a thousand airdromes here in Brazil, we have 27 major airports in the Brazilian capital cities. Uh, it would be impossible to make sure that all airports would have um, staff in their uh, supply chain. So, one of the options and was to, to think differently and how can we have like the regulatory framework that would provide uh, stability and the right signal, signal for the market without putting too much burden and making the cost uh, a barrier for, uh, for having uh, this production. So instead of a blending mandate or tax incentives, we came to an alternative of a CO2 emission reduction mandate by the use of SAF. And why this was different? Because when you, you put a mandate, a blending mandate, you make uh, almost an obligation for every airport to have it because the blending would go for the distribution of SAF. Putting the mandate uh, on the CO2 reduction, it would be uh, the main player here is the airline. So the airline has to comply with this mandate, reduce its emission by using SAF. This gives another logic in the Brazilian case, and we can um, focus and have all the SAF blending in the major airports where it's closer to the production, and then we can lower the costs for making it available for the, the airlines, uh, while also putting um, uh, an incentive for the most efficient SAF. Here, we are not closing uh, and saying that only this kind of SAF from sugarcane, from soy would be available. We would say for, we, we are saying for the airlines, you can choose which one you want. And this gives, gives the incentive for, as it's, it's a CO2 emission reduction, to look for the most efficient one, the one that generates the, uh, the most uh, reduction on CO2. It fosters also competition um, in the use of the best technology available and the most efficient staff. The next slide, please. Uh, another, another thing that it was very important for us was to ensure that um, as this is a nascent uh, industry, it is important to make sure that it would comply with the international standards, not only from the technical side, ASTM, uh, standards, but also ICAO uh, standards. Aviation needs a network, it's interlinked. Uh, we cannot separate uh, what goes for the domestic, what goes for the international. It, it, uh, it's a network. So the product needs to be standardized. So in the Brazilian case, our policy takes, th takes this into account and we are um, trying to align 
the targets of our policy with the targets of ICAO and the sustainability criteria and uh, all the methodologies regarding life cycle emissions uh, with uh, the ICAO. So um, this allows SAPs to be used in the main hubs and also allow us to, to use um, book and claim systems, for example. Um, as I said, we can, um, the, the, the mandate goes for all airlines that operate in Brazil, all the, the Brazilian airlines, but they, it doesn't mean that they will fly for those airports that have SAF. So this kind of possibility uh, ensures that uh, we can comply with the mandate. Next one, please. Um, and just one more. Yes. So uh, another important here uh, pillar was to make sure that we have clear objectives to, um, to facilitate the financing of SAF, especially by our National Development Bank. And um, this is something that we still need to develop a little bit and see how it goes with the, the National Bank. But uh, it's already there. It's the main conclusion that you need to look the demand side with the, the, the mandate, and you need to look the, to the supply side with uh, an environment that fosters uh, investments and financing for the production. The next slide, please. And here comes as well the taxation. Even though we have very limited uh, resources from the public budget, uh, budget to uh, give incentives uh, to this market, uh, we already have in Brazil a law that uh, determines that this, the tax for biofuels needs to be equal or less than um, the tax applied to fossil fuels. So this is already a good uh, signal, and we are discussing internally how we can improve uh, this policy as well to make sure that we are putting the incentives for renewable fuels. Next one, please. So the two, uh, the fifth and the sixth pillar are more, cons are more on the quality and certification. Um, we need to also make sure that the staff producing in Brazil complies with uh, safety issues for aviation and quality of, uh, um, of this kind of fuel. And it goes with the same kind of requirements uh, for the traditional fuels. And finally, the governance. Uh, in Brazil, we have uh, the Ministry of Mine, Mines and Energy, the Ministry of Infrastructure. We have regulatory agencies, uh, NAC is one of them. So in this environment, who is in charge of what? What are the roles? And how we make sure that uh, this, the target for the CO2 um, reductions mandate is uh, adequate, is uh, has the right incentives, but also uh, that we are not putting too much burden on this in, on the, the aviation industry. So this was something that we came up and um, on this policy, on this um, uh, draft policy, we are putting much of the uh, roles on oversighting uh, the, the mandate on the aviation authority. So our uh, regulatory entity is the airline, are the airline. So the ANAC is going to oversight uh, the mandate, but the target is um, from the, the Ministry of Mines and Energy. They have like a council, a national council, and these dialogues with our energy policy. So the target itself is uh, defined by the ministry. Please, if you can go one slide more. So in my final remarks, I would say, I, I want to say that we need to take into account that the main goal of any SAF production policy is the environmental goal. So we, we need to make sure that we are putting the right incentives for the production of very uh, sustainable SAF that complies with international standards and that, that it's most efficient in terms of uh, CO2 reduction. And um, it's essential to bind this public policy to CO2 emissions. So the final goal is not to have a bland 
few, but have a very efficient few in terms of CO2 reduction. We need to, to, make to, to, to ensure that we are uh, heading to the energy transition in the end. The second uh, conclusion is that we should be very technology and feedstock agnostic, especially at this point where this industry is still uh, very uh, little, I would say, in most countries. If you look at Europe and the US, where they are putting in place the policy, the production is there, but we still not has, have the challenge to broaden uh, this production in the world. And um, I think ICAO is very, uh, it's uh, discussing very high level standards on SAF. So uh, we do, should not put more uh, requirements than already are in place by ICAO. And also we need, we should not put uh, much more requirements in terms of feedstock and barriers because we need to, to, to go for the alternative of SAF. Also, we need to have a very holistic approach. And as I said, uh, the Brazilian policy was not uh, focused only on SAF. It had a more comprehensive view on ground trans transportation and shipping. And this is important because uh, sometimes in, in the SAF, SAF case, we have a co-product from SAF, which is the, uh, the green diesel. So um, we should not take, um, uh, put, a, let's say, a mandate on SAF and not take into account the impact on this, the other industry and vice versa. And finally, uh, the mandate is only one of the public policy tools that are available. We have to have an integrated approach that takes into account the demand, but also the supply. And I would say a fifth uh, conclusion here is cooperation. Um, we cannot have this industry relying only on government support, on government uh, policies. We have to, to have an integrated approach in the sense that also the industry need, uh, needs to, to be on board of, on this, um, participate in the discussions, and also take their actions uh, in order to, to foster and, and promote the production of SAF. Uh, this is what is happening in Brazil. As I said, this is a, still under discussion. We have uh, a new administration now, and we are hoping that uh, those pillars would be the basis for the policy that will be presented uh, from the executive branch to uh, the Brazilian Congress um, this semester. And by the, the end of this year, hopefully we are have this policy in place in Brazil. So thank you so much. I'm here uh, to answer any questions. If you have any other doubts, uh, here are the, uh, our website and also our email. We are more than available to have further discussions with you after this seminar. Thank you so much. Thank you, Marcela. Yeah, indeed, uh, the Brazilian experience on ground transportation biofuels like is really like a global example. Like, and really hope that with all these initiatives, these will be replicated like for for SAF as well. Like, uh, it's uh, really really uh, exciting to see uh, all this movement there. Like, thank you very much for sharing the experience. So uh, we're running a bit uh, late on our schedule here. So I'd like to move to our next uh, speaker, who is Mr. Satoru Togami from Japan. So Satoru, are you there? Okay, I, I'm here. Uh, thank you, Bruno. Or uh, can you hear me? Yes, perfect. Thank you very much. The floor is yours. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. And good morning, good afternoon, and a good evening uh, to all the participants of this session. I'm Satoru Togami uh, from JCAB. I'm chief of Carbon Neutrality Promotion Office and the in charge of environmental issues related to uh, the international aviation sector, such as Koshir. So first of all, uh, I would like to say thank you to the AKO Secretariat uh, for organizing this really important seminar to realize the broader expansion of the global development and the develop deployment of SAF. And uh, it is great honor to have this uh, wonderful opportunity to share our experiences related to SAF policy. So before I uh, go into the main uh, topics, uh, so I, as you can see in the background of this slide, uh, our office, Carbon Neutrality Promotion Office, has uh, just launched our YouTube channel uh, last month, uh, which provides the Japanese audience with uh, information about the decarbonization in the aviation sector in terms of public relations of our activities. 
I'm afraid all the information in the content is in, in Japanese. So we are now considering providing English content uh, in the future to share our uh, thoughts uh, with broader people around the world. Okay, uh, now it is time to jump to the main topic, our main content of today. So uh, yeah, thank you. So in this session, uh, I first explain Japan's governance uh, structure for SAF policy making and then introduce two symbolic initiatives, which are the roadmaps and the SAF target in 2030 and the amendment of the Civil Aeronautics Act. Then I'll give you the essence of the activity in the private sector, namely Act for SAF, Act for Sky, sorry about that. And the, at the end of my presentation, I will share with you the uh, JCAB's future vision. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, uh, this figure show the governance structure of JCAB. Uh, the Assistant Vice Minister for International Aviation, uh, Mr. Toshiyuki Onuma, as of now, uh, generally supervise international affairs in aviation sector, including sustainability issues in ICAO and the UNFTPC. As for our section, which is highlighted in the green meshing in the figure, uh, Carbon Neutrality Promotion Office consists of three groups, Planning, International Affairs, and the SAF. And uh, it was established in the last April to strengthen the, uh, strengthen the organizational structure for dealing with aviation sustainability issues. And the uh, Carbon Neutrality Promotion Office was also supervised by the Director General of Aviation Network Department, uh, such as the Policy for Domestic SAF Expansion. On the other hand, uh, other measures for decarbonization in the aviation sector, uh, such as aircraft new technology and the operational improvement are handled by the safety and the security department and the air navigation service department respectively. In addition, our office works closely with other relevant divisions in JCAB, uh, such as International Aviation Division for coordination with IKO of foreign governments, and the Aviation Industries Division for relation with Japanese airlines. We also work with our other ministries, such as our MOFA, Ministry of Foreign Affairs, which is responsible for general diplomatic policy, and MOE, Ministry of Environment, which is responsible for general environmental policy, and the METI, our Ministry of Economy, Trade, and Industry. <coughs> Sorry which is responsible for general economic and industry, industrial policy. METI also supervises the oil industry, so we are working closely with METI to expand the development and the deployment of SAF. Okay, uh, next slide, please. Uh, in March 2021, uh, JCAB established the study group on CO2 reduction in the aircraft operation sector in order to ex accelerate uh, efforts to reduce CO2 emissions in the operation sector towards the two, uh, 2050 carbon neutral decarbonized society. And the study group developed the roadmaps for promoting decarbonization in the aviation sector, which consists of new technology, improvement of flight operations, and the SAF. I'll talk about the roadmaps later. So uh, to accelerate the actions described in the roadmaps, uh, JCAB has set up public-private councils. For SAF in particular, uh, its membership includes airplane operators, airport authorities, uh, oil companies, and the relevant ministries, etc. And it focuses mainly on coordinating supply and demand to facilitate the development of domestically uh, produced SAF and the construction of the future supply chain, which includes imported SAF. Key actions recently uh, led by the Council are the coordination of SAF supply and demand and, and the demonstration of imported uh, need SAF for operate in Japan and assistance for safe certifica uh, certification at ICAO. As for the actual activities, uh, JCAB conducted the SAF demonstration with this month, uh, which examined the uplift of imported SAF blended with kerosene in Japan uh, to identify any issues which need to be addressed to build our, our future supply chain in Japan. And we have also launched an assistance program for safe certification uh, to support SAF developers uh, whose products do not have a default value to register as call share eligible fail. Okay, uh, next slide, please.
As I mentioned in the last slides, in December 2021, uh, JCAB has developed our roadmaps in the areas of new technologies, operational improvement, and the SAF to promote decarbonization in the aircraft operation sector. And these roadmaps were uh, shared among the public and the private parties in Japan. In addition, two, uh, two quantitative decarbonization targets have been set in the roadmaps one of them is uh, replacing 10% fuel consum consumption by Japanese airlines with SAF in 2030. And the another one is uh, reducing CO2 emissions by about 10% through the future efforts of improvement of flight operations by renovating the air navigation services. And I would also like to mention that uh, roadmaps are included in the Japan State Action Plan uh, which was revised in 2021 and is published on the IKO State Action Plan website. Okay, the next slide, please. So uh, in light of providing a legal fundamental to activities for decarbonization in the aviation sector, our Japanese government amended the Civil Aeronautics Act and the Airport Act last year. In this amendment, the promotion of decarbonization in the aviation and the airport sector uh, has been clearly stated at the beginning of the act, uh, the purpose of the act. JCHAB has also established an institutional framework for decarbonization to share actions based on the roadmaps so that each operator and the airport authority is able to proceed their actions voluntarily and systemically. In this framework, uh, the Minister of Land Infra Infrastructure, Transport and Tourism uh, established their basic policy, which includes a target for decarbonization in the aviation sector and the actions to be taken by stakeholders. And Japanese airplane operators and the airport authorities will be able to develop their own decarbonizational plans in line with the basic policy and obtain a ministerial approval which will encourage and facilitate decarbonization efforts by various stakeholders. In addition, with this framework, JCAB can promote further decarbonization in the aviation sector by integrating all decarbonization plans submitted by the individual aeroplane operators and the airport authorities. JCAB has just kicked off this framework a few months ago. So we are currently consulting with Japanese airplane operators and helping them develop their own plans. Okay, next slide, please. As for the lessons learned from our experience, our experience, uh, we'd like to share an example that we faced in terms of the relationship between fuel suppliers and the airlines. JCAB has been involved in a chicken and chicken or egg situation between the supply side. Uh, SAF suppliers and the demand side and the aircraft operators. On the supply side, uh, fuel suppliers argue, argued uh, that the demand side should provide a concrete volume of SAF demand so that they so that they can properly invest in the necessary facilities to produce SAF. However, on the demand side, aeroplane operators ask to be shown how much domestic SAF will be available in a given year so that they can incorporate these projections into their management plan. So considering this situation, uh, JCAB couldn't decide which side to take. So instead, we decided to set a concrete target volume for use of SAF in order to facilitate the production of domestic SAF. So uh, we believe that this uh, experience teaches us that uh, civil aviation authorities can play the role of a regulator but uh, uh, it could also be a coordinator. Okay, thank you. Uh, next, next slide, please. So uh, in this slide, uh, I'll talk about the private initiative for SAF in Japan, namely Act for Sky. Uh, but actually the Japanese government is in, isn't involved in this initiative. So I will just present the essence. So Act for Sky was launched on March 2nd, 2022 as a voluntary organization uh, with JG, JGC Holdings, Revo International, ANA and JAL as lead companies to, uh, to promote and expand domestic SAF. The basic concept is like that. Uh, Act for Sky is, uh, is an old Japan initiative aiming to achieve carbon neutral skies uh, through the promotion and an expansion of sustainable aviation fuel. 
We will create a movement that crosses the boundaries of the companies directly involved in the domestic SAP and the companies and the organization required to, required to build a supply chain in order to realize the commercialization, diffusion, and expansion of domestic SAP. As you can see in this figure, right, uh, there are 24 members companies as of February 2023. It consists of various industry players, which includes airplane operators, uh, field producers, airport authorities, uh, aircraft maker, uh, trading company, heavy industry, food company, etc. You can visit the website and uh, see more detailed information in English uh, using the link at the bottom right of this slide or just uh, Google Act for Sky. Okay, next slide, please. Uh, actually, this is my last presentation. So at the end of my presentation, I would like to share JCAB's future visions. So these visions currently form the basis of our work with foreign civil aviation authorities. Uh, firstly, uh, JCAB believes uh, that uh, it is important to have a bilateral or multilateral relationship with certain states in order to increase the use of SAF among them. In this sense, we are exploring our possible relationships around the world to realize our visions with some policy coordination. Lastly, uh, JCAB welcomes any states or organizations on board uh, to make this world a better place in light of the no country left behind principle. So uh, that is all my presentation and thank you very much for your kind attention. Uh, so everyone gathering here understand that there is no uh, one size fits all, but I hope that my presentation will help you to develop staff policies in your state. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Satoru. Yeah, I like your example, like of the chicken and egg problem, because this is what we hear in our uh, stock taking seminars, for example, like we come, we see the airlines coming here and say like, ah, we would buy, but we don't have the fuel producer. And the fuel producers say like, ah, we would produce, but we need to know that someone's going to buy yeah. it. Like, it's great to see like that you're trying to bridge that gap, like and make, put everyone on the same table, like, and and see what needs to be done to, to address this problem. And thank you. And thank you for this invitation that you're having here for further coordination. And of course, like we at ICAO, like we will be happy to help like on facilitating this coordination between uh, ICAO member states. And uh, thank you very much for being available for this kind of coordination. We will definitely pur pursue that moving forward. Thank you very thank much. You. So with that, uh, I'll move, like to move to our next speaker, who is uh, Ms. Mathieu de Tannus from France. Mathieu, de, are, are you there? Can you hear me? Yes, uh, just doing that. Can you hear me properly? Yes. OK, so the floor is yours. Thanks, Mathieu. Great. Thank you. So I will be quick because I know we are on a very time restricted time limit. So Mathilde Tanous from France, I'm working for the French Civil Aviation Authority and more precisely for the direct uh, tra air transport directorate. And we overlook several topics among those related to SAF and also the EU ETS, which is the market carbon in Europe. Um, so I will basically brief we present you what we've done so far in France at the national level, not taking into account that we can do it without the European level because we're part of Europe, just like Eva presented. So I will go a little bit quicker on the European topics because Eva did a very good job before me and she presented everything. So basically in France, what we've done so far on the SAF, it all started, and I'm counting six years ago in 2017 um where we it's not for SAF, but mainly for climate changes what we where we set sorry uh ambitious objective to achieve carbon neutrality 2050. uh we did that uh, through the national low carbon strategy or so-called snbc which is the acronym we love the acronyms in france so we have lots of them but this one basically sets um carbon quotas for the entire sectors that emit uh, greenhouse gases. So you go from transport, buildings, industry, agriculture, energy production, waste and everything. And it provides a, a sector strategic orientation for everyone. It's like it's a budget, it's carbon budget, basically, that is revised regularly. Uh, we are now, we, we have approved, agreed two years, three years ago now, we are almost in, a, we are almost in April, the second version. So we are working on the second sequence for the moment. 
Following the enhancement of the EU objective uh, for 2030, we had to revise our national strategy for climate change, basically. So we are about, we basically are working towards our new French energy and climate strategy, so called SPEC, that should be adopted mid of next year. It's a roadmap, it basically it's a data roadmap to uh, carbon neutrality by 2050, but it should also ensure that we get prepared and adapted to climate change impacts, kind of new. Uh, in order to do that, there is two steps that we need to go through. We need to, to uh, adopt our first climate energy programming law. So it would be really not a strategy, but a law this time. So like really deep inside regulation um, that should be done before July, 1st of July this year. And following that, then we will revise our national low carbon strategy to adopt the third version that will uh, take into account the enhanced objective for 2030, so reduce the cut upper sectors. Uh, in order to do that, of course, we need to rely on consultation with and high level, high level, but intense consultation with general public, sector experts, economic players, local authority, you name it. And sectors will also have to provide a roadmap. Uh, so for the aviation sectors, they, they worked on it at the end, during the end of last year, and they recently presented their conclusion on how to basically reach the 2030 goals for aviation um, during a high-level meeting we had. So it's not adopted yet, but we have the first conclusion. Or we've been presented the first conclusion. Next slide, please. So now moving on the SAF part. So yes, we did, like I said, almost at the same time, we started to work on the SAF through a green growth commitment, which is a public and private uh, sector partnership that allows us to work deeply on the matters from top to bottom or A to Z, A to Z for a uh, for example, sorry. So we have on the state side, we have the energy, transport, and um, sorry, I'm missing one. Uh, ah, leading states, energy, transport, and economy, sorry for that, with the input from agri agriculture and defense, like the army was really interested into the topic. So we work with them. And on the private side of things, we had like several stakeholders from Airbus, Air France, Air France, Suez, and Total, so all, stakeholders from the various step of the value the chain the value chain of for SAF. So following that uh, in-depth work, we published our roadmap. So it's not a mandatory objective. They are just objective is the roadmap that we have in 20 that we published in 2020 based on a blending approach, basically. So you have the numbers and we're missing okay. So those numbers are based on 2019. So I don't know why it's not appearing on this presentation, but so that's not the, the last update. That's based, it's pre-COVID pre data, basically. Uh, the roadmap is based on five principles. Um, the you, we need to use SAP that are uh, ASTM qualified. So and to ensure the highest level of security for the flight that has to remain, um, the high level of sustainability for SAF. So we are targeting mainly so-called advanced biofuel in Europe, so those made from waste, residues, and also uh, PTL. Uh, the, uh, the value chain has to be economic, there is a, to be, ah, there is to have an economic viability, sorry for the English, uh, for the production sector, and not to rely mainly and entirely and only on subsidy from the states, so that has to be, it's a key point. Um, we also want to to have everything done nationally to be consistent at the European level, but also the international level, because the aviation sector is not something that should be regarded just at the national level. It's not workable. It's not like the road transport sector. So we definitely need to get the EU and international uh, link and connection on those one. Um, so this is what we done in 2020. Next slide, please. Moving forward. We launched a call for expression of interest to assess the stakeholder interest and needs to develop and basically build your production unit in France. We wanted to know what they wanted, what they have in mind, what they needed to do it, uh, the size and level of units they were looking at, if it were mainly uh, research and development or industrialization, those kind of things. As really, really to basically to build the knowledge on the topics. And following that, we launched in July 2021 a call for proposal 
uh, to support the development of French self-production sector. So this one was mainly focused on pilot construction or engineering studies. So we were not looking at industrialization phase. We were really the first, I would say the first part, the first step to be done uh, with uh, an envelope of 200 million euros. He, 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 we closed it last year in September, and so far we have five winning projects. Uh, one is still under review, so maybe we'll get the sixth one. We're waiting for that. Following the, those, those actions, we also worked at the national level to more concrete application to basically operationalize our roadmap and objective to ensure that we meet those. So the, 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 the main one we did was a blending mandate of 1% implemented in January 2022. Um, this is still the same level, and I think I will go into deeper details. Yes, we still have the same obligation for 2030, uh, 2023, sorry for the numbers, and it should be raised for 2024 to 1.5%. So it's an energy, it's um it's an energy objective, not a, a volume one. It's just kind of not doesn't make such a difference, but just for you to notice. Uh, mid of last year, we launched a working group to address the industrialization phase, knowing that we have the call for proposal ongoing, we wanted to work on the next stage, next step, basically, and trying to be ready as soon as possible. Uh, it was just at the government level, with no interaction with the, the stakeholders on the private sector for the moment. We wanted to see what was possible within our, uh, and what we wanted to push forward and um, the roadblocks that needs to be, um, to be solved. And in December 2022, we also launched, we also did a study on PTL fuel potential in France based on our electricity mix, basically, and other resources we may have. We wanted to know, uh, have a better understanding on these uh, sectors and this um, fuel production sectors precisely. Next slide, please. So just a little bit of technical information on how we manage our blending mandates. We use an existing uh, tax instrument that were, has been in place for at least 10 years for, for the road transport sectors in order to meet our European uh, energy, renewable energy conception, mainly in the road transport sectors. It's an incentive mechanism to basically encourage the blending of biofuel into diesel and gasoline and now kerosene. It's set up via budget law, so it's kind of formal in a way, and it's revised annually. Um, and we uh, try to have it evolve every year in order to, to meet, sorry, the SAF roadmap objective that we have. Um, I don't know, to be noticed for the for this tool, uh, all those uh, sectors like diesel, gasoline, and kerosene have a separate annual objective. They are non fungible, so you need to use. Uh, you need to meet each of, the, if you are concerned in selling those products, then you meet, you need to meet, sorry, each of those individual objectives. You can't use biodiesel to uh, answer your, uh, to, to meet your gasoline or kerosene objective and vice versa. It's individual. So like I said before, it's 1% last year, 1% this year, and it will be raised next year. And we have a tax uh, penalty level, should I say, of one, uh, 168 euro per hectoliters. So I know it's a weird unit, but it's a custom unit and I can't do anything about it. So I would have preferred liters or cubic meters or tons, but it's the way it is, hectoliters. Uh, a, this is how it works over here. Um, and in order to, to basically uh, trace and ensure that uh, the end users, the airlines have information about the SAF they are buying. We upgraded the biofuel management platform that has been developed in France uh, to manage everything in terms of renewable fuel. So next slide, please. Yes. So it's a brief one. Uh, just a, yes, just a schematic. So on the right, on the left side of the, the slides you have basically what's it's in place for the road transport sector and who is interacting with this platform and on the in the orange section on the right side you have what we have to be developed in order to in order for airlines to get the sustainability information uh, they needed and they required um, when they were buying a stuff that has been blended in France. So for the moment, it's worked only for the stuff that is blended in France and acquired in France. Uh, and why we had to develop that? Because the, the system, as it works at the moment, uh, sustainable information are not 
pushed towards the end users because it was for the road transport sector where basically users are French people filling in their cars and that doesn't need to get the information on the top of the type of biofuel they are using and the GHG emission reduction they, they can claim and so on. So that was something that was not present for the moment. And next slide, please. So moving forward, and I'm almost at the end of my presentation, uh, moving towards industrialization requires collaborative work from the transport, energy, and industry sectors. We recently launched a high-level task force on self-industrialization, uh, and we have the support of three ministers, uh, and so energy industry and transport. Um, we are at the moment doing a self-value chain stakeholders consultation to gain the their view and needs at the present knowing that the the regulation um background evolved at the eu and international level so we during a consultation to get the up-to-date information of what is needed and what they want to do in france in order to uh, develop the best um measures to be implemented in france to support the industrialization of SAF. Uh, the timeline is mid-2023, so in no time, in a way, for such a high level and huge topic, but we're working hard to be able to meet the timelines. And we really want to basically move to the next stage and be able to support uh, SAF in industrialization, the, the building of, uh, in. Oh, sorry, I can't speak in English anymore, but uh, SAF production value chain at an industrial level, just like it's written on the slides. <laughs> So next slide, please. Yes, and that would be my our lesson learned so far with the the, man, the blending mandate and everything we've done. Uh, SAF is a challenging and cross-sectoral topic to address, which makes it not always easy because not everyone has a transversal vision and, and have a broader vision for SAF and know basically where to go and what uh, key players or um, uh, topics to, to work on. So that may be sometimes complicated, but really challenging and interesting. Uh, for investment to be, to be made, just like the other speakers raised, uh, regulation continuity and amortization upheaval at the national, regional, and global levels. That's something really important that's not always easy and that we are all working towards to make it easier for the industry sectors uh, and uh, both producer and airlines. Uh, enhanced consultation of all stakeholders from energy to airline is key. It's really important. That's something that we really appreciate in France that uh, we take the time to consult everyone uh, and to gather everyone under the same approach. So that's something uh, that we, we're trying to push and to keep. And technology neutral approach is important. Uh, there is various and there is various SAF production pathways. There is not one which is better than the other. We need the diversity because the objectives are really high, and we need to rely on the various options we have to be able to support the decarbonization of the sectors. And that's it. Back to you, Bruno. Thank you, Matthew. Like it's good to know, like that you uh, that France is adjusting like your ground transportation policies to also encompass SAF, right? I believe this is the case for many other KO member states. Like so, we need to ensure this uh, level playing field between ground and, and uh, transportation and sustainable aviation fuels. Like, and good to know that you're moving on that, and we're also like coordinating. Uh, it's interesting to see like this coordination between the national policies and the regional that you have in the EU. So this is all very welcome uh, experiences. Thank you very much. So uh, uh, with that, like I would like to move to our last speaker, Mr. Alejandro Rios, who will give uh, the perspective like from the United Arab Emirates, like and what is being done to foster self production. So Alejandro, are you there? Yes, Bruno, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, okay. perfect. Okay, the first arts, thank you. Thank you. Give me one second here. So please, the, the next slide. So, uh, I, you know, uh, the, the UAE is a very big market in terms of aviation. Um, Dubai is the largest airport, international airport in the world with most international passengers. Um, and, and, you know, the aviation sector for the UAE is a very important sector in the economy. It um, essentially 
encompasses approximately 15% of the GDP of the economy. And so it's a, it's a major initiative here in the UAE. The UAE has also announced a number of strategic initiatives, among which uh, it, it was the first Arab country to announce a, a net zero uh, commitment by 2050. And you know it has already been uh, announcing and investing uh, you know, a significant amount of money in, in that respect. Um, the UAE also has uh, published a, a hydrogen leadership roadmap, which essentially uh, will try to set up uh, the, the conditions so that the UAE is capable of capturing 25% of the global hydrogen trade by year 2030. And so with all of these uh, strategic initiatives, so the next slide, please. Um, we have that the UAE has been working, next slide please, has been working on a SAF uh, roadmap, which was, was published um, initially during COP27 last year in, in Egypt. And then again, uh, during Abu Dhabi Sustainability Week this year in, in, in January of 2023. And this uh, SAF roadmap has been uh, put out by the National Committee on low carbon and sustainable fuels for the aviation sector. This committee was established in the UAE by a decree by the prime minister's office, and it has as its participants, the Ministry of Energy and Infrastructure, which is leading the committee, but it also has the participation of the Ministry of Climate Change and Environment, the Ministry of Advanced Technology and Industry, and the Ministry of Economy, who is the head sector for the General Civil Aviation Authority here in the UAE. In the UAE SAF roadmap, the, 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 the committee established two specific task forces, one for working on sustainable aviation fuel and the other one for working on low carbon aviation fuels. And so uh, through the SAF task, uh, task force, uh, this SAF roadmap has been now uh, published, and it establishes five key principles. Uh, the first principle establishes the ambition. Uh, the second principle uh, talks about accelerating SAF technology deployment and innovation. Uh, the third principle it talks about developing the national regulatory environment for sustainable aviation fuel in the UAE. And the fourth principle is about building local capacity to uh, boost in-country value. And finally, the fifth principle uh, is about leading uh, international collaboration. And so with this, uh, the next slide, please. These are the members of the UAE SAF committee. As you can see, we have uh, aircraft operators, the two main aircraft operators here in the UAE, both Etihad Airways and Emirates Airline. We do have a participation from Dubai airports, and we have a, particip a wide participation from several members of, of the industry that are all interested in making sure that the SAF industry is established in the UAE. The next slide, please. So uh, going back to the first principle, uh, in, in the SAF roadmap, we have established uh, an ambition of producing 700 million liters of SAF by year 2030. Um, this is a very ambitious target because as you may imagine, in the UAE, we really don't have access to, uh, to many biogenic sources um, that are being used in many other countries around the world. And so, as you will see in a, in a, in a slide uh, a little bit later, you know, the main focus for the first 700 million liters will be using some biogenic sources, specifically uh, municipal solid waste and hopefully some uh, used oils, used cooking oils and some other vegetable oils. But in the long run, or in the medium and long run, the, the idea is to be able to produce fuels via the power to liquids pathway. And so uh, right now, for these 700 million uh, liters, we are looking to build uh, anywhere between three and five facilities uh, with an investment of anywhere between seven and nine billion dollars in the entire value chain by year 2030. This will, in, in turn, bring about 18,000 new jobs in the UAE and a, you know, a set of other benefits such as potential for accumulated emissions reductions and, of course, the capacity, the potential capacity to export some of these fuels uh, to other markets. The next slide, please. 
The second principle is very important. It talks about, uh, as I mentioned, accelerating SAP technology deployment. And this is, will happen uh, through uh, you know, supporting research development and demonstration facilities uh, related to SAF in the UAE. Uh, you know, the UAE has been working together with industry so that this is, uh, is, a, is a target that can be accomplished. And we are working to establish a dedicated center, a dedicated R&D center that will focus on mid to high TRL technologies uh, so that we can actually work with them and bring them to market as quickly as possible. Next slide, please. In terms of the national regulatory environment, we have already established uh, uh, you know, one, an, another working group that is looking to, to analyze and you know, look into the different policies that are available, uh, both from the supply side, from the demand side, and of course, those that enable trade opportunities. And it is very important uh, to be able to establish the right types of policies because there's, you know, here in the UAE, we really have no, uh, no stable production of soft or no production of soft currently. And so establishing a mandate at this point in time would actually be counterproductive. And so we are looking for ways in, in which we can support the industry. The, the main target for the UAE is to start producing uh, uh, low carbon aviation fuels. And these low carbon aviation fuels will serve as a bridging technology to take us to a, a constant and, you know, uh, ideally a good uh, supply of sustainable aviation fuel in the future. The next slide, please. In terms of boosting in country value, again, uh, you know, the, there is a, a proposal to, to start recognizing SAF as one of the key uh, industrial sectors here in the UAE. And so a specific department within the Ministry of Energy uh, will be created. Um, and of course, we also want to be able to train and to you know, create the necessary conditions so that we have the human resources that can actually work in an industry of this nature uh, in the future. And so we are working through universities and through you know, other institutions to make sure that we have the capacity to develop uh, this in-country value and to develop the necessary conditions so that people are able to be trained and to participate in this particular industry. The next slide, please. And finally, uh, you know, I think that this has been a common thread uh, throughout the presentations that we have seen. Uh, we all know that without collaboration, the soft industry will simply not happen. And so the idea is to be able to participate both through ICAO and through collaborating with uh, you know, many different uh, countries uh, around the world in making sure that we're able to establish this industry and to grow this industry in a sustainable manner. And so it is, you know, this is recognized as one of the, as one of the key principles because we believe that collaboration is going to be incredibly important. The next slide, please. And so, as I mentioned to you, uh, this is uh, from uh, also a report that was published last year. It is a report that looks into the PTL pathway that is very relevant here in the UAE. And as you can see from now until 2030, there is a significant consideration of the HEFA SPK pathway uh, in, with the use of used cooking oil and municipal solid waste and potentially uh, vegetable oil coming from the salicornia or the halophytic pathways that we are working on. But in the medium to long term, uh, the main, main uh, ways in, way in which we will be able to produce sustainable aviation fuel will be through the power to liquids pathway. And in that case, again, the, the, the relevant uh, feedstocks will become uh, hydrogen, both in the case of blue hydrogen, which is you know, the traditional way of producing hydrogen, but with carbon capture use and storage. And of course, the production of, high, of green hydrogen or low carbon intensity hydrogen through water electrolysis and, 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 and you know, using those technologies in the best way possible. So we will also be working heavily on carbon capture uh, both from the direct, uh, you know, directly capturing carbon and as well as car capturing carbon from point sources so that we're able to recycle as much as the carbon as we can. Uh, of course, all of this will need uh, a lot of support from uh, research and development, and this is exactly what we're working. Next slide, please. 
And so just to, to close out, as I mentioned, uh, collaboration is key. R&D will play a very important role. And uh, it is our view that we need to take advantage of our local capacity. The UAE will be one of the first countries to produce uh, low carbon aviation fuels at scale. And so this will, even though it's not a huge contribution, it will be a, a key contribution in uh, getting us on the pathway to reduce our carbon footprint uh, in the right way. We do recognize that there are several uh, weaknesses and threats that we must take into account. And you know the, the development of a PTL uh, industry here will not be easy, but it is something that the UAE has been, you know, is committed to doing, and we will be doing this uh, in the next few years. And with that, um, thank you, and you know, open to questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alejandro. Like I like it that you highlighted also the 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 benefits, like the social benefits, like in terms of the job creation in the UAE. So this is something that uh, we also need to have in mind, like whenever all these developments, like they will also reflect not only on environment, but also on socioeconomic development from uh, for our state. So thank you very much for these. Uh, and also this pathway, like you starting with uh, biogenic uh, feedstocks and moving forward, like with the new technologies. This is something we also need to keep in mind, like the, the time frame of the developments. So thank you very much for that. So with that, like just a couple of closing remarks here. Yeah, we're getting to the to our slot of time frame here. So if you go to the next slide, so there is a, a reminder of our again, like the updates are in our website. Please take a look there. Like, and we'll be posting this presentation and the video like very soon uh, on the on the XF uh, website. So please check it out there and spread to your network. Like it, it's publicly available on our website too. So the next slide here, just uh, again, a reminder for the invitation that I made in the beginning. So if you know like any, any experts or consultants that want to participate on these two efforts here on the development of this IKEA template of feasibility studies, and also on the, on the real development of the XF feasibility studies, please contact us and let us know, we'll be happy to coordinate. Like, and this is really not a, a secretariat initiative. Like it's really all the states together uh, to, to reach these objectives of further uh, de developing SEF uh, in, in a global level. So, uh, so with that, I'd like to thank you very much. And uh, we'll come back then on the next uh, series, like in May. So and and again, the, the here is really a uh, invitation for for the feedback. If anything is missing on this list here, if you want to have any further insights on any other topics, please let us know, and we'll try to find again like the best speakers on it on all the topics to provide the best insights for uh, for the XF partners. So with that, thank you very much, and see you in the, the next one. <laughs>